Head over to BoardGamePrices.com to find the best price and availability for thousands of games. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here and today we're all going to be different houses and we're going to be running the kingdom. But each of us are going to have different agendas that are hidden from each other and when dilemmas come up, we're going to have to discuss, negotiate, bribe, work together, but you have your own hidden goals and you're trying to force a path to create the best kingdom available. Today we're going to be taking a look at King's Dilemma. This is from Horrible Games. This just made my number one most anticipated game coming out at Gen Con. Uh, if you haven't seen that video yet, I put a link below and you can click, click up here in the corner and check that video out. Uh, but I'm really excited about this. Now this game is a legacy game. It has a lot of spoilers. I'm going to give you an overview of how the game works without spoiling anything. I'm also going to give you a, sort of a first impressions after having some games under the belt uh, without spoiling anything as well. So here we go. King's Dilemma is a legacy game that you'll be playing about 15 times where each player is going to have their own house and over the course of the 15 games you're going to be gaining prestige and crave which will help you score and how these score will depend on the choices you make over the course of all of those games. Now even though you're encouraged to play with the same group throughout the entire thing, you can bring other people in and there's actually 12 of these different things to allow you to bring new people in throughout the campaign. Now I'm not going to spoil anything for you in this overview. I'm going to be showing you different things and cutting away and showing basic examples in the rule book and things like that. On the back of these it will have a story for each of the houses. You'll get to name your house by writing on it. Over the course of the 15 or so games, you're going to be gaining prestige and or crave. Uh, and at the end of the game, these are going to score differently depending on the choices that you've made throughout the games. Now looking at a different board, each of them have different achievements. Some of them have a narrative achievement that you're trying to do, like find harmony between knowledge and spirit. And then there's other achievements that will happen throughout things that you do in the game, like having different resources be the highest, uh, or things like that that will trigger. So there's certain things that you're going to try to trigger a certain amount of times throughout the campaign, and when doing that you're going to be able to get yourself some more things like prestige or crave or coins and things like that, and sometimes some actions that will trigger. Now over the course of the game, resources that the kingdom has is going to fluctuate going up and down. We've got influence, wealth, morale, welfare, and knowledge. Also the stability of the kingdom will move up and down. Now these are going to be going, you know, getting more plentiful and less plentiful depending on the choices that the group makes. And at the beginning of each game, players are going to be drafting to get a certain hidden agenda. And these are going to have, have you score points depending on where those resources are that I just showed you at the end of the game. Like Greedy, they want you to have resources either way up or way down. Opulent want them all to be on the high side. Moderate wants them to all be within that range. And the amount of resources that are in those ranges, you'll get a certain amount of points from your hidden agenda. Also, each time that you select this for a game, you'll be able to cross off certain things. And if you use it enough times, you'll get a certain amount of you know, prestige or greed, which again is the, the, the points that you're really trying to get for the end of the campaign. And so this is the main way that you score, because each game, the winner's gonna be who has the most agenda points, and that's gonna be things like this. This is the main way you get those, but those are gonna help you unlock, and throughout the game you're gonna unlock more of this prestige and crave, which is the end of the campaign points. Now behind their shields, players are gonna have their agenda card, some coins, and some power, which is gonna help them in the sort of negotiation and the voting periods of the game. Now here's the box of the game. Uh, there are 74, I believe, envelopes in here. And each of these have a set of cards. You'll start with double zero, you'll open it up and you'll start going through the game. But you'll be unlocking many of these throughout the game. Now each of those envelopes will have a story card that you'll put next to an icon and then you'll read the story. I'm not going to show you that on the back of this. Now there'll also be some dilemma cards which you'll cover with this little tile here. And the way this works is it's played over multiple rounds and each round a dilemma is going to happen. Now I don't want to spoil anything so I'm just showing you the example they have in the rule book because if, if they thought it was safe to show this, I feel it's safe to show this. Essentially it's going to be a story and then it's going to tell you what your choices are. In this case, you know, they suggest that, they're, they're, that the bread will be taxed. But the royal treasurer thinks it's, you know, damage to the royal treasury. Rejecting it may damage the welfare of the poor. Do we approve the tax cut? So there's going to be two choices. There's going to be an I, which is a yes, and a nay, which is going to be no. And depending on the card, certain resources or things are going to be in those different spots. So showing that, we put it on the board like this. Now this just shows you 
generally what might happen when you either approve or disapprove this vote, but other things might happen that it doesn't really show you. In this case, if it's a yes, most likely the wealth is gonna go down. And so on that resource track I showed you earlier, it would go down. Here this says, well, there's gonna be some sort of legacy sticker that is gonna probably come out that will affect you know, certain things over the course of games. Then starting with the player with the most prestige, they're going to be the first player, and they're going to be able to essentially have four possible choices. They can vote with some power, one or more. This is basically currency saying, hey, I have one power towards a nay vote. Or they could say, I have one power towards an I vote. Then we'll go to the next player. Well, let's say the next player places two out on an I. Now, as soon as someone has the most, they're going to take this and be sort of the, the, the prestige, the, the first sort of player, if you will. And this, is, this can continue changing hands as people outbid each other with their power. And essentially, this is important because the, this whole, you know, the voting doesn't end until, you know, the last player in turn order from here has sort of finished. Now, instead of voting for I or nay, you can pass and gather. You'll actually get a coin from the supply, put it on your pass. You're going to get some more power currency for the future rounds. We'll show you how that works in a minute. The last possible option is you'll get a coin on pass and you'll get the moderator marker. And this is important because you're going to help break ties. And ties are important because uh, there's bargaining here. You can freely give money, uh, especially to the person who's the, the moderator, to say, hey, look, you know, make, make the tie go for me. I'll give you some money, things like that. If you exchange money, it's binding. If you don't yet exchange it, it's not binding at the time. Uh, but there is some bargaining and negotiations you can do with other players during this period. Now, another interesting thing about the voting is anybody whose vote didn't pass, they get to put those power behind their shields again. They don't lose the currency. But the ones that did get added to here, and the ones that passed to get more power would split all these evenly, and they'll have more currency for future votes and future rounds. That's a cool little way to, to keep the, you know, the flow of the game changing so that the same people don't win every round. Now, some other things happen, but in general, the, the, it's going to resolve. And this is, again, I'm showing the rule book because it doesn't spoil anything. But depending on whether it was a nay or I total vote, you would flip over that card. This I know it's showing a different card than I was earlier. But you would flip it over and it would tell you what would happen. And it would tell you certain things that, that you know, maybe resources go up. Maybe, uh, you know, you put a sticker down. Sometimes you might open up, open up a new envelope. Sometimes it might possibly end the game depending on how far into the game it is. Things like that. So all these different things happen. And resources will be moving up and down. And there's this interesting mechanism with these. Like, let's say this was to move down. It would move down. And if it's already this dark color, it would move down again and get some momentum. And then in an, on additional times, if it continues to move down, it's going to move down two more than it's supposed to. Uh, so once things get momentum, they move quite a bit more. And the opposite happens in the upper end. It's an interesting sort of uh, mechanism there. Also, as things move up or down, the balance of the, of the kingdom is going to move up and down. And this is one of the possible end game triggers. Because if this token either gets all the way to the bottom or all the way to the top, the king is going to get abdicated and it's going to be the end of the game. Now, I talked a little bit about some stickers that might get placed down. There's a whole ton of these. And sometimes cards will have you affix stickers on certain parts of the board that's next to some of these resources that change the way the game works. Um, and at the beginning of future games, whoever has sort of the most recent thing, and sometimes this will be good, sometimes it'll be bad, they'll get a certain sort of open agenda token, which will make them score certain different ways at the end of each game. So that's how things and decisions you make affect scoring in future games. For example, if you were given this because you had the most recent sticker here in a future game, if this resource is the highest on the track, you'll get three points. But conversely, if you had this, if it was the, the smallest or the lowest on the track, you'll get minus three points. So different things that you do, you know, that you've contributed to will change how future games work. Now, in addition to dilemma cards, sometimes there's event cards, sometimes there's narrative story cards, and sometimes a story will end. And then you'll see who actually signed the cards, the most of the cards in that storyline, and they'll get some sort of bonus. So there's a lot of other things going on in the game as well. Now, one of the ways I told you the game could end is if the balance of, of the kingdom gets all the way up or down and the king gets abdicated. But also, after about six dilemma cards, if skulls come up, it'll also end the game. And then in the rule book, there are a lot of these there's empty uh, score sheets like this, and everyone's going to score based upon their hidden agenda, which is where the resources were and how many were there. Plus, they'll also get points for how many coins they have in their ranking of first, second, or third in that. And all these points are different depending on they're there. Uh, we just we already talked about sort of the open agendas, which will get points if you know that the resource is the highest or minus points if it's the lowest. If you have some of these, they'll score here. And if you have the most power left, you'll get two. If you have the second most, you'll get one. And whoever has the most is the winner of that game by getting those agenda points. 
But then, depending on those agenda points, whether you scored first, second, third, fourth, or last, depending on the amount of players, you'll get a certain amount of prestige and a certain amount of crave. And remembering that you're going to get those on your house here. And again, this is how you win the entire campaign at the end of the 15 games or so, and how these score will differ depending on the choices that you've made. All right, here we go with King's Dilemma. Um, Again, this made my number one most anticipated game coming out of Gen Con next week. Um, and if you haven't seen that video, there's a link below that you can click. This, you know, whenever you put types of lists like that together, uh, it's almost unfair because a lot of times you just have too high of expectations of something. Uh, and the reason why this one made my number one is because it looked so unique and it looked like it's just had so much potential to be amazing. And that's why it made my number one. So with that in, in mind, let's go into this. First of all, the thing I, that, that this thing really screams is sort of the immersive storylines that come out of here. Now I've read that they actually hired a professional story writer uh, and that spent three years coming up with all these stories and man, does it show. The cards read well, the stories are very immersive, different storylines are coming out, you're kind of following this, oh, this led us to this, which led us to this, and all those storylines are out, you can refresh some of those storylines if you've taken, you know, some weeks off and come back and you kind of, those come out, you know, and you read those. And it really feels like you're in the middle of the story and it really feels like you are creating the story. It's, 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 it's a very immersive experience and they definitely are doing what they're trying to do here. Uh, and it uses that dilemma card system, which is really cool. That whole, you know, I'm gonna make a choice, it's gonna open this. If I had made another choice, I would have opened something else. And you know, it's, it's that whole idea that's it's great. I, it's, it's, it's called a system. I assume that they're gonna try to start using this on other games and I could see this working well in so many other instances, so many other games, so many other themes. I'm glad that this is the first one because it's working out great. Uh, the game creates great conversation and negotiation. A lot of this game is played above the table uh, where you're talking about different things. You're talking about the dilemma. Should we do this or do that? Well, if we do this, what well, this will happen? Well, what might happen if we do this? Well, before we did this, and now what, we're gonna turn and do this? You know, and it has us a lot of these great conversations. Uh, obviously, like any game, you're gonna need the right group for a game, uh, but this one even more so, you need to be able to have that group that's sort of social, that likes to talk about things, and things like that, and likes to negotiate and try to, Get gain one up on each other and things like that. You can bribe others, which I like really uh, a lot. You can, hey, you know what? If you if you do this, if you vote this way, I'll give you X amount of dollars. Or you know what? I'll let you sign a card if uh, if if you just let me stay the, the leader here and 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 don't go against me or contribute just a little bit more. I'll let you sign it. You know stuff like that. Uh, the bribing is really cool. Uh, I like that aspect of the game. I've always loved negotiating and bribing. It works well here. The voting system here is really clever. Essentially, it's an auction system. I mean, that's all it really is with a moving first player sort of prestige person. And I like that when someone outdoes someone else, the prestige resets the turn order and other players that have bid before can kind of bid again. Um, and I like that because two people could be on the same page and trying to get the same agenda to pass, but they might be at wits with each other because they want to be the one to place the sticker or possibly sign a card, who knows, and they're outdoing each other. And it's just really interesting. And the people that didn't, that aren't in there, that, that voted against it, clearly know they lost, but they don't care. They want these people to spend all their power because, uh, you know, next round, people are going to try to pass and gain that power back. It's a really interesting mechanism. I like the way it works. You can also trick some people into signing a negative card. Like, hey, you know what? Let's talk about this. Yeah, why don't you... Um, those are, they're going to vote I, let's vote nay, you're the first player, go ahead and throw down heavy. They throw down heavy, the other players pass, I pass, and of that player, I got what I wanted, but now that player uh, now has to sign a negative card, which is going to be bad for them. So you can do all these little tricks here that the game has so much interaction with it. I felt like this game was sort of a cross between a few games, Arabian Nights, because of the storytelling and the different things that happen, Fog of Love, which was a game where you're, 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 it's a very narrative game where you're, you've got sort of different agendas, hidden agendas. You're trying to uh, make choices in a narrative that in all reality, what they do is just move counters up and down for agendas. So kind of felt a little bit like that. And Dead of Winter a little bit, where that whole sort of choose your adventure style thing, like this doesn't have crossroads cards, but it's similar of like certain things are gonna happen and you're making different decisions and you have, you know, the, the hidden agendas and stuff. So it's kind of like a cross between all three of those games. 
Uh, the game has simple rules. I mean, yes, the rule book's like 30 pages, but it's big print, it's written well. There's not a lot of mechanisms here, which I like. Uh, a lot of it, again, is played above the table. The momentum, another interesting mechanism is as resources are going up or down, they're possibly flipping when they move in that direction, and then they'll move an additional time, and then they'll get momentum and they'll move two additional times. And I like how it slides things, so things can begin to move pretty quickly uh, in a round if they start moving in the same direction. And you know, thematically it makes sense, and mechanically it's clever and it works really well. The open agendas, uh, those are really cool. When you get those stickers at the beginning of the game, you're going to get more or less power if it was positive or negative. But now everyone knows that you have an agenda that you're trying to get that resource to be the highest or you don't want it to be the lowest and it's going to affect your score and it's, it's an open agenda because everybody knows about it and so people are going to be messing with you and working together against you to, to keep you away from that or possibly make it happen if it's negative so it, it, it inserts forced negotiation to the game just probably for those groups that don't negotiate as much, it really turns it up. Our group loves to negotiate, so it adds even another bargaining chip, so it's great. The achievements, each of the houses, wow, 12 different houses to choose from. All of them have different achievements. You're trying to unlock those. After you do a, a, a certain amount of time, you'll get some special abilities, some rewards, really cool. Uh, I've heard some chatter online that, wow, why is this game $80? Uh, that's what the MSRP is gonna be selling for at Gen Con. We thought about last night, even 15 games at $80, it's $5 a play. And it does take about an hour, right around an hour our plays took just over an hour an hour five minutes something like that but the box is pretty well so even 15 hours of plays 15 games five dollars a play oh my gosh we talked about it afterwards like yes even if even after the first few games we're like oh my gosh yes we would each we played four of us we would each easily pay twenty dollars just for tonight's experience never mind the whole full 15 game because it was so amazing so those, I'm gushing over this game, but let me talk about some negatives. I uh, gotta be fair here. Uh, it's a legacy game, so by the nature of that, certain things are gonna turn people off. This is a game that you cannot replay. You're gonna be writing on stickers, you're going to be taking stickers out, you're gonna be writing on cards. You can't replay the game, and some people just don't like that. Um, I don't tend to mind it as much, but that might be a negative for you. Uh, the end game scoring is, for me, a little, at this point, at just a few games in, is just going to be a little bit too ambiguous because it talks about prestige is one thing and crave is one thing. Crave is not bad, but you only really get it when you're either you're sort of in last place if something happens at the end of the game or sometimes you'll get some if, if, if the king gets ab 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 abdicated. Uh, so it's not, and it just says that both of these can help you win the game in the end, but it doesn't really give you any information. So going through the game, it's like, oh, you're trying to get your hidden agendas, which get you prestige, so you think that's what you're always supposed to be doing, but maybe not necessarily. And you don't really know what that crave is going to do. Should I be kind of concentrating on that? Should I try, you know, should I go for the agenda at the beginning of the game that's going to get me crave? Should I purposely take a game and try to get this abdicated so I can get some more crave? We don't know. And so I wish the scoring, the end game scoring was a little bit less ambiguous, but again, um, it probably can't be because uh, because then it would spoil something. I have a feeling it's going to be something cool. Look, the designers of this game are tested and true. I trust them. They the two people that made Dragon Castle. One of them did Potion Explosion. One of them did Photosynthesis. Um, you know, po uh, uh, what was the other one? Alone. You know, they've done a lot of Steam Park. They've done a lot of great games. They have my trust, and so far the game is so amazing. I've got to trust that at some point the scoring is going to come apparent. Now this is the type of game where actually the end of the game, who wins, it doesn't matter. I don't care, none of us really care. But we would like to know what are we really trying to do here. It would help formulate some strategy, so I wish the scoring was a little bit less ambiguous, but I understand it probably can't be just because of the nature of the game. Uh, this is best with the same group because you've got the storylines, you've got the history, you've got the meta game. Now it does say that you can bring people in at any point, that's why there's 12 house shields. But it also, I, I, I talked to the designer about this after we played, and I said, well, how do they even, they don't, they don't start with anything. How are they even in the game? And I said, even people that come in later can rank high in the end, which even more makes me think, who knows how this scoring is going to work. But it is going to be best with the same group, and sometimes that's really hard to do. Uh, and this game, it's, it's a game for adults. Don't play this with kids. There's certain things in the game that you're not going to want to deal with, with them. There's also, it deals with some specific issues that some people don't want to play a game about. Uh, some people want to play a game and just have fun and relax and enjoy themselves. This game pro poses some tough moral issues that you're going to have to handle and talk about and negotiate with. Uh, and some people just are not going to want to do that in a game because it can be, it's some serious stuff. And so just be long, knowing that that's there, it might turn you off. Um, and in that regard, sometime your agenda might want you to vote for something that you're personally against for. 
Um, and you're like, oh, well, to get my, oh, this could really be good if I vote this way. But personally, I really have a problem with this. And you might find yourself conflicted. Now, the rules say a really good thing about, hey, this is on purpose. And, you know, this we don't support or, or do it, you know, or, or, or uh, advocate any of the stuff that's in this game. This is a fictional game. Play, your, play it as a fictional game. Don't get too tied up into it. But it is hard to remove yourself from some of the things that are happening that you want to fight for but your agenda tells you to do something opposite and sometimes that can rub you the wrong way but if you know that this is coming and it's just a game and you play it that way it's going to be fine but those are just some of the things to, to watch out for but overall wow um the game was my number one most anticipated and i've got to say it's living up to that so far it it's it's a very unique experience a unique system clever mechanisms super immersive i cannot wait to see where this thing goes and after the 15 games and i'm done with it I'll be okay with that. I'll still go back to the other envelopes and look through all the different things that would have happened, could have happened, and, and then the game's gonna go in the trash. Uh, <laughs> but the game is this good that I'm sure that this dilemma system is gonna pop up more and more and more, and we'll just continue to be able to experience this in other worlds, I believe. So that is my sort of first impressions of The King's Dilemma. Uh, from that, you should know whether this is possibly for you or not. I'm super high on this game. Now, I typically give a saxophone serenade for games that I keep in my gaming library because I can't keep everything. I have limited space. And at the end of this, I'm not going to end up keeping it because it's a one and done game, but I'm going to give it a saxophone serenade because of how amazing it is. And I'm going to be keeping it through the entire 15 plays. And hopefully I'll do a follow up video at the end for that. So let's, let's hit it now with my gaming library saxophone serenade. This has been the Game Boy Geek, breaking down barriers, growing relationships through board games by helping you find the next one you'll love. This video was shot on a Game Topper, the ultimate gaming accessory. After successfully fulfilling their first Kickstarter, Game Toppers are taking the world by storm. Now you can get your own portable gaming top by participating in Game Topper's Kickstarter 2.0 starting June 25th, 2019. New styles, new sizes, and amazing new game mats. Go to GameToppersLLC.com to enter a full Game Topper system valued over $1,000 to also bring you to the Kickstarter project page and to Late Pledge.